Disclaimer. Instead of this video being a pure developer commentary over gameplay footage like the ones made for the first two games, it will be a fully edited video essay in which I spend most of it talking about the development of One Night of Lumpty's 3. This video will contain spoilers and viewer discretion is advised. About 13 years ago now, on the forum I used to frequent, I invented an imaginary user with the name Popular Guy, and the running gag was that every message this user posted would receive at least a dozen upvotes, regardless of what it said. I had to find an avatar for this character I invented, and on a whim, I did an image search for Humpty Dumpty, I'm not really sure why, and found this, which it turns out is from a bit on The Muppet Show. I couldn't tell you why this image worked so well for Popular Guy, but the joke was well received, and I wouldn't be surprised if it left an impression on me that subconsciously led to Flumpty Bumpty years later, who I similarly invented on a whim as a joke. It never would have occurred to me that his popularity would grow to the degree that it has today. One Night at Flumpty's 3, for me, is the end of a very long joke that took on a life of its own. I've made no secret of the conflicting feelings I've had about this goofy little series, but I know I'm not alone when I say it's a rough feeling when your most successful creation, or at least one of them, is something you didn't put your heart into. I made the first game, in about three weeks, to practice software I'd never used before. Not only was it a test parody game, based on a series I really only had a passing interest in about five years ago, its cast is entirely made up of characters most people seem to have more passion about than I do. A lot of artists refer to their original characters as their children because of how much love and care they put into them, and I definitely feel that way about some of my own characters but I've never had that experience with Flumpty, or Blam, or the others. For me, they're just kind of a means to an end. All of this is to say, when I found Scott Cawthon's email about the Fazbear Fanverse initiative in my trash folder, the reason it was there at all is because I had filters in place to automatically delete emails about Flumpty and FNAF, because I had no expectations of doing anything with either of them again. In fact, I had also deleted all the source files for the first two games, which made it more difficult when I had to remove all the copyrighted material from them for the official releases because somebody had to decompile the games for me, and after that the only way for me to edit the images was to draw over them. So that was fun. I joined the initiative knowing I didn't have to make a third game if I didn't want to. Even still, to me it only made sense to try because, of course, one last game to tie up loose ends for the fans and for myself would make the whole thing more special. So I got started, and this is going to sound strangely familiar, but I started with a dream I had. A few years back, probably about four years ago now, three or four, I don't know exactly, I had a dream about a hypothetical third Flumpty game that took place in an empty cabin on a mountain with a blizzard outside. On each of the four walls of this cabin was a wide-open door Flumpty and Blam would sometimes appear behind, and just looking at them was enough to make them vanish back into the storm. If I had directly translated the stream into game form, the gameplay would have been garbage, because all you'd have to do is spin around in a circle and you'd win. Still, I liked the idea of a real third game taking place in a freezing cold environment, so I made the office a freezer and turned the temperature into a mechanic. In hindsight, I realize the furnace is pretty similar to the music box in FNAF 2, which I have some reservations about, but my hope was that it would feel like a safe zone for the player at first, and then I would introduce a mechanic which shows that not even the one safe zone is truly safe, like any good horror. I knew early on that I wanted to bring back the whole gang from the first two games without introducing any new characters, because this final game is sort of their curtain call. I briefly tried to work in the blind monster I left out of Flumpty's 2, but the idea didn't fit then, it didn't fit this time either, it would have felt forced, and it was simply not meant to be. The reason Empty Bempty is not in the game, by the way, is because by the time I announced the game, it was actually already finished, and I just made it sound like it hadn't been started yet because I wanted to give Click Team more time for the ports without people complaining. I don't know, it, it took a long time anyway. Either way. Empty Bempty was added to the first game after the third one was already finished, and it was just meant to be a little bonus anyway, nothing really important. Blam, as is tradition, is pretty neutral. He follows a path to the office, and you know he's about to enter when he has the Kevin Jr. pose. Golden Flumpty has always been a reference to Golden Freddy, who is a hallucination, 
Turning him into a hallucination like the ones in FNAF 3 just made sense in my head. Someone had to come out of the furnace, and the Red Man seemed like the obvious choice because he's associated with fire and lava, although the idea of having him teleport through a portal in the wall was sort of carried over from the Grunkfist portals in the cancelled One Week at Flumpty's plans. Several things were carried over from those plans, one of the most obvious things being the snapshot camera, which I repurposed for use in the office instead of the security cameras because I wanted to force players to use the monitor to determine when a character is right outside, and lighting up the darkness in front of you with a flash of light just seemed like a cool way of fending them off. When balancing the game, I felt like there needed to be more of a reason to make every snapshot deliberate, which is why if you flash the light at Grunkfist the impatient clown, he attacks you, unlike the other characters. It also worked out well, because the room Grunkfist comes out of this time is an exhibit for clown art, which is an idea I was rather happy with, and it makes sense for an art exhibit to have a sign prohibiting flash photography. There was no way I couldn't bring back both the beaver and the owl this time, but one thing I didn't want to carry over from the cancelled one-week plans was the toilet paper mummy beaver idea, because I knew everybody would be expecting that, and I was right! I also tried to find a way to implement both characters separately without their mechanics being identical, because having every character behave in a unique way is just my preference, but nothing I came up with felt natural. I eventually had the idea, to kill off the owl like I killed off the beaver, and combine the corpses of these two functionally very similar characters into one twisted-looking chimera, which felt nice and spooky and didn't sacrifice gameplay. I think Eyesore was the last character whose mechanic I came up with for the first night, because by that point it felt like I'd covered all the bases with the other characters, and I didn't know what else to add that would maintain the balance of the mechanics. Most likely what led to me putting Eyesore in the door was the fond, eerie mental image of all those eyes staring at you from the darkness, and I'd say it serves as a nice extra incentive not to look at the security cameras for too long. The number one idea that I absolutely wanted to bring back from the cancelled one-week plans was a hectic night dedicated entirely to Flumpty with a dramatic shift in tone. Flumpty Night, as I call it, was the whole reason I wanted to make a third game in the first place, even six years ago. After all, Flumpty is the namesake of the series. He's immune to the plot, he can transcend time and space. He really should be the scariest character, and I did everything in my power to make that happen. The end result, in my opinion, is even better than I'd always hoped it would be. I'm glad I didn't design this night in the one week at Flumpty's days, because I've learned a lot, and I was able to capture exactly the mood I wanted back then, just with better gameplay that handles a lot of the same elements in a different way. I brought back the rooms that swap places on the map, the starry hallway, the laser doors, the room decorated with a bunch of glowing lines. The addition of the dinosaur is my friend's idea. This night combines a lot of new ideas with the best of the plans I had before, and it doubled as fan service, so that's great. It was cathartic, in particular, to animate the spider-legged Flumpty scampering through the vents, because that imagery had been in my head for years, and I was so eager to make it a reality that I'm pretty sure it's one of the first things I made when I got to work on Flumpty Night. I was also excited to make the jump scare, because Flumpty is more or less a reality-bending god of death. so I wanted to make his jump scare look like a Lovecraftian nightmare. Beyond that, I really didn't go in with much of a plan. I just kept writing down ideas in a notebook and adding them along the way until it became utter chaos. Before I really started brainstorming ideas for this game, I thought that maybe all the monsters could just be variations of Flumpty, just different Easter eggs. Not gonna lie, I completely forgot I said this until people reminded me after the third game came out. There was one idea I remember having for Flumpty Night that I didn't include, which was the idea that sometimes the game would randomly appear to lock up or reset or go back to the title screen, like the sanity effects in Eternal Darkness. But as quirky and fitting as that might sound on paper, in practice it would have disrupted the gameplay too much and quickly gotten annoying, so the only sanity effect I implemented was the heads-up display glitching out.
the decision to compose an electro swing song for the end of the night came to me while I was listening to Caravan Palace. Go figure. I wanted to greatly outdo the little jingle in the second game while also making reference to it, and I actually thought it would lighten the mood at the end of the night, but after putting it in, I think it just made things more intense, which is even better. I think it wraps up all the mayhem in a nice little bow, and I'm very pleased with how it came out. Flumpty Night is really the climax of the game, and even though hard-boiled mode is meant to be the hardest of the three nights, I didn't go out of my way to make it the hardest challenge it possibly could be, because narratively it's the falling action, it's the farewell to the characters, and I wanted people to actually be able to beat the night and see the true ending. In Five Nights at Freddy's 3, which always felt like the proper ending of that series to me, the background music of the Shadow Bonnie minigame was a music box cover of a classical piece by Schubert, which in English basically translates to Swan Song No. 4, Serenade. I used that same music box theme in the cancellation video for the One Week at Flumpty's game years ago, and it felt appropriate to sort of call back to that for the bittersweet final night of the series. So I made my own cover of Schubert's Serenade, and that's what plays in the game. One of the big reasons the One Week at Flunty's game crashed and burned is I was trying to force lore into a fan game series that I think actually benefits from not having any lore, so the story was not a focus in this one. But it does have just a little bit more story than the others, and I think it fits. It occurred to me that the goal of the player has always been to survive until 6am, and technically the Flumpty series has never ended a night on 6am. The first game ended with Ham, the second game ended with Spam, but never Six. It also occurred to me that this series is called One Night at Flumpty's, and Flumpty is above the laws of time, so I could make the argument that every night in the series is the same one night being reset over and over again with different rules until 6am finally arrives and you're free. I was happy with that idea, and it resonated with me on a personal level as well, because in some ways, I've felt trapped with Flumpty and have been waiting for a feeling of release to move on to new things. The final shot of One Night at Flumpty's 3 is a callback to the image I used in the trailer for the first game, and it's the very same shot I had planned to end the One Week at Flumpty's game with. Incidentally, now that I've added a hard-boiled mode to the first game, it has two nights, the second game has two nights, and the third game has three nights. That adds up to seven nights, which is one week. So, in an unexpected, roundabout way, we did get to spend one week at Flumpty's after all, and I was able to end it how I always wanted. If I'm being honest in regards to both Flumpty's and the Fazbear Fanverse initiative, it feels like I have more negative memories than positive ones, and maybe that's just because the negative ones stand out more easily. I've felt torn about my relationship with these games, and I think all the Fanverse developers agree that the initiative could have been handled way better than it has been, with unclear communication being perhaps the biggest issue of all. But hopefully, since my games have been the first ones in the lineup, I've run into most of the major problems, and the experience will go more smoothly for the others. Major shout-out, by the way, to Phil Morg, who is also part of the Fanverse developing FNAF+. Plus. I have no idea why Click Team was given the unreasonable task of porting multiple games that weren't made in their own software, but Phil came along and did all the remaining necessary work for the Flumpty ports. He made a stylish menu for the console bundle, and he even found and fixed a few minor glitches that slipped under the radar. I could not have asked for anyone better for the job, and he's frankly the sole reason Flumpty's 3 came out before the death of the universe, so I'm very thankful, very, very, very thankful for his help. An additional shout out to Etches Sketchy, who is a good friend of mine, and also quite possibly the biggest Flumpty fan I've ever known. She has her own original characters who were initially inspired by the One Night at Flumpty's cast, but they're not even fan characters, they're her own distinct characters in her own world that she's creating, and that to me is even more flattering and cool, and she really made the release of the game more rewarding with her infectious enthusiasm. I'd also, of course, like to thank Scott Cawthon for this opportunity. Even though there have been times when I've felt like I don't belong and maybe I shouldn't have joined the initiative at all, and there have been times when I've been 
Confused and frustrated and likely difficult to work with, Scott has been patient with me. He's educated me on certain things and kept my best interest in mind the whole time. Ultimately, when all is said and done, I'm glad that I made One Night at Flumpty's. I'm glad that I joined the fanverse, and I think through this initiative, Scott has made a lot of people's lives a little brighter. Yeah, this is pretty much where my relevance with the fanverse ends, with the possible exception of merch in the future, although I still don't know whether that'll happen or not, so we'll see. My last Flumpty uploads will be the One Night at Flumpty's 3 soundtrack, and then I'll start a new journey. If you're still interested in Five Nights at Freddy's content, you won't be seeing it from me, but you will be seeing it with the other members in the fanverse, so if that tickles your fancy, please buy their games when they come out. They're all cool people with wonderful creative skill, and they deserve your support. With that said, take care, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in whatever we do next. <laughs>